So we're in chapter 3 now, and uh, Ezekiel's going to get his marching orders, what he's called to do. You remember our introduction in Ezekiel. Ezekiel's heart's desire was to become a priest. He was studying for the priesthood, right? Uh, but it would never be. Although he would be officially or not technically a priest because he was of the priestly line, he never officiated as a priest, did he? The temple was gone. He was, he was taken into captivity at how old? About 25 years of age, 25 years of age. And, and while he was there in captivity, the temple was destroyed in 586 BC. When he became of age where he could have been officiating as a priest, the temple was no more. There would be no opportunity for that. But now, now at 30 years of age, God helps him to realize his true calling. God is calling on every one of our lives, doesn't he? Every single one of us. God doesn't call you just to <laughs> have you be a spectator of what's taking place. God calls you to be called into his service for the progression of the church, his kingdom. And the progress of the kingdom is always on the shoulders of those who are willing to submit to the calling that God has upon their life. And so you have to ask yourself, what is your calling and, and are you engaged in what you're called to do? On Saturday morning, I'm going through the pastoral epistles with the fellows. It's First and Second Timothy and Titus, and it can sum up very easily. Know your calling, enter your calling, and abide in your calling. That's those three books. First of all, you have to know what your calling is. And unfortunately, too many who are called by his name have no idea what God's called them to do. But once you know, it's not in the knowing, it's in the doing, right? So you've got to enter into that calling. What is it that God has called you to do? And are you doing it? in his strength and his ability. And then don't grow weary. Abide in that calling until he calls us home. Right? The calling of God is irrevocable. Right? He doesn't uncall you. <laughs> so Ezekiel, Ezekiel's receiving his calling as a prophet. Moreover, he said to me, Son of man, eat what you find. Eat this scroll and go and speak to the house of Israel. Has that ever happened before where someone is called to eat a scroll? Yeah. How about before Ezekiel? How about Jeremiah? Turn to Jeremiah chapter 15. Jeremiah 15, 16, your words were found and I ate them. And your word was to me the joy and the rejoicing of my heart. Is that true? Yeah. yeah. I was thinking about that today, what a joy it is that we have his word. And how it does rejoice our heart. Our heart swells with thanksgiving and joy. Just a contentment and a peace and a happiness. It can be very upsetting what's happening in our, in our world. In our society. Now they want to forgive all these college debts. So irresponsible. And what's that going to do to curb inflation? <laughs> what's the objective here? The objective is to spend us into ruin. To bankrupt the nation. You'll have nothing and you'll like it. <laughs> That's precisely what they're doing. Aren't we glad that the investments we've made... The true investments are eternal. They're in the heavens. And the dividends, the rewards, are guaranteed, certain, right? I was speaking with someone uh, just a couple of days ago and asking me about when I was going to retire. I said, well, I serve the Lord, and my retirement is out of this world. It's when I leave here. And as long as my mind holds out and my body is fairly strong... I'm going to try to keep doing what I do and be used of the Lord until the day he takes me. But for Christians and for our calling as believers, well, there's no retirement. Well, we take our ease and our rest. You did, you did a teaching one time on cemetery. The word cemetery, remember that? And where the cemetery comes from where? It's the sleeping place, resting place. Yeah. That's when we'll rest. And it won't be a, a, a 
physical rest, will it? It'll just be a rest from our labors because everything will be accomplished and done. Paul refers to it as that rest, uh, well, Paul, the writer of Hebrews, that there is a rest that God has for every one of us, not here, that the Sabbath is a sign or type or symbol of, but it's the sabbatismos in heaven, that eternal rest where our minds are free. Our hearts are just swelled with thanksgiving. There's no anxiousness, no concern. There is no labor. Sometimes I get up in the morning, I think about all the things I have to do, and I think, I'll never leave this place because I'll never get done. I always tell Gail, home ownership, you know what that is? Home ownership is where the work never stops. <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, we take our rest one day. But here, what a joy it is. And John, go to Revelation chapter 10. John, like you said, the little book in Revelation 10, John was instructed to eat. Chapter 10, Revelation, everybody there? Eight, then the voice which I heard from heaven spoke to me again, saying, go take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel who stands upon the sea and upon the earth. And I went to the angel and said to him, give me the little book. And he said to me, take it and eat it, and it will make your stomach bitter, but it will be as sweet as honey in your mouth. And I took the little book out of the angel's hand and I ate it, and it was sweet as honey in my mouth. But when I had eaten it, my stomach became bitter. Well, there are going to be several interpretations or meanings of the way that happened. It happened to Jeremiah. It's going to happen to Ezekiel. It happened to John. What does it mean that it's sweet as honey? you got a new fondness for honey, huh? <laughs> yeah, Rob and I took a ride over to Be Well. You know Be Well honey? Yeah, that's the best place to get your honey. It's a little bit of a drive, though. And uh, is that the first time you've had honey? Yes. That's unbelievable, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Where in the Bible does it say it's as sweet as honey, honey in the honeycomb? Psalm 19. Psalm 19, the word of God, right? Sweeter than honey, honey in the honeycomb. Hmm? But it was as sweet as honey when they brought it to their mouth, but when they started to digest it, process it, right, it became bitter. What would be the interpretation of that? Happened to Jeremiah, happened to John, it's going to happen to Ezekiel. Yeah, yeah. Jeremiah is giving a message of judgment for 40 years. For 40 years, he prophesied a message of judgment that was coming, and they didn't believe him. Ezekiel is doing the same thing, and there were these false prophets in Ezekiel's day saying, no, 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 don't settle down here in Babylon. Don't buy houses. Don't give your, your sons and daughters away in marriage. We're going back to the city. We're going back to Jerusalem. They wouldn't go back. 586, when the temple was destroyed, reality set in. John in the Revelation, what is he talking about? It is real. Whew, it's the judgment of the entire world. It's a global catastrophe, a global judgment once again. And that's what's going to happen, right? So that's why it's so bitter. But it's true, isn't it? We can't deny it. There's a lot of people denying it now. They don't want to have anything to do with Bible prophecy. They don't want to talk about the Old Testament because that's a God of judgment. I guess they haven't read the Revelation. They don't want to talk about Israel, and we see what's happening in Israel now, don't we? Yeah. And the uh, Biden administration very soon to enter into this Iranian agreement, which is far worse than the original agreement. And even the liberals in Israel recognize how dangerous it is and calling Biden out for the irresponsible way in which they're handling this whole situation. Weak leaders produce difficult times. And this weak leader is producing very difficult times. Our enemies are being strengthened and emboldened. And we're worried about gender correctness. It's insane. Eat the scroll. Take my word in. It will be as sweet as honey. Why? Because it's the word of God. Because it's true. The judgment that comes with it may be upsetting. But we're thankful that God has told us ahead of time, aren't you? 
Yeah. So I opened my mouth, and he caused me to eat that scroll. And he said to me, son of man, feed your belly and fill your stomach with this scroll that I give you. And so I ate, and it was in my mouth like honey in sweetness. <laughs> yeah. Even, even the words of judgment and condemnation that are here in the scriptures can be sweet, isn't it? Evil, the devil, judgment. Why does God allow it to exist? For his glory. Even evil today is used for the glory of God. God permissively allows it to continue to exist to this point for his glory. He's going to judge it. One day we're going to enter into a realm where righteousness reigns everywhere for all time. Praise God. Hmm? And evil will be done away with once and for all. But right now, right now, it exists for the glory of God. And he said to me, son of man, verse 4, go to the house of Israel. Now he's speaking to Judah because Israel, the northern kingdom, is no more. But the house of Israel was the 12 tribes, right? The sons of Jacob. Go to the house of Israel and speak my words to them, for you are sent to a people of unfamiliar, for you are not sent to a people of unfamiliar speech or of hard language, but to the house of Israel. How difficult it would be to try to communicate with someone who doesn't understand you and you don't understand them. That happened this afternoon, didn't it, David? I was over here trying to talk to that fella, and no comprende, you know? <laughs> I couldn't understand him, he couldn't understand me. What a difficult thing it would be if God sent you to a people to give the message of his truth and you couldn't speak their language, nor could they speak yours. But here, God is sending the prophet to his own people who speak his language, right? And they speak his, he speaks theirs, and there should be no problem with the understanding or the communication. But yet, what does it say? Not to many people of unfamiliar speech or of hard language, whose words you cannot understand. Surely, had I sent you to them, they would have listened to you. Hmm. What does that remind you of? If God was sending a prophet to a people of unfamiliar speech, they would listen. But I'm sending you to your own people, and they won't hear you. What about Jonah? Who was Jonah sent to? The Ninevites. Ninevites. Oh, boy, they were a different culture, weren't they? Yeah. Very different. Jonah did not want to go at all because he had no, no respect for the Ninevites. They were very cruel and barbaric people. But yet what happened? As Jonah walks out of the water bleached white because he was in the belly of this great fish and all of his hair is gone and everything. Can you imagine? <laughs> Casper, the unfriendly ghost. <laughs> he walks out in the water walks out onto the shore and starts to deliver a message. And then miraculously, God allows it to be understood and the entire city repents and turns to the Lord. Wouldn't that be glorious? Yeah. A week ago, my son had to do a funeral for a young man who overdosed. How, how, many, how many young people overdosed last year? 107,000. 107,000 young people overdosed last year. 77% of those were fentanyl overdoses. And this year's numbers are exceeding that. Where's this fentanyl coming from? Or our friends. They're good people, Biden says, the Chinese. And now the fentanyl that's coming across the border, what does it look like? Chocolate. Looks like candy. What are those colored candies uh, that kids love so much? They're sour. No, not gummies. Uh, Skittles. Skittles. They look like Skittles. Yeah. Unbelievable. And that's the biggest fear is these children are going to see these things and think it's candy and one pill will kill them. Amazing. Mm. Surely had I sent you to them, they would listen, but the house of Israel will not listen to you. Because they will not listen to me, for all of the house of Israel are impudent, hard-headed, and hard-hearted. All of them. Hey, 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 when is this? When is, what year is this? It's about 590 or so, somewhere in that area. 
What, what, what's happened to the northern kingdom of Israel? They're gone. When, when, did they, when were they destroyed? When did they go into captivity? When did the northern kingdom in the city of Samaria be destroyed? 721 B.C. But were, were they without a witness? Anybody witness to them before that? How about Amos? The witness to Israel, the northern kingdom, that occurred before the judgment, one of the prophets was Amos, the other one was Hosea. Hosea. Amos was in 760. When was Hosea? Yeah, 755. Yeah, it's that, that, that area. You know, yeah, you know, you know. It's all in here. Prego, it's in here. Right? Israel had a witness. As far back as 760. 200 years, at least. Right? Practically. How many were witnessing of the truth of God's word to the southern kingdom of Judah? Do you know some of the prophets? How about Joel, 835, Micah, 735, Isaiah, 740 to 680, Jeremiah, 672 to 580, Habakkuk, 607, Ezekiel, the prophet we're talking about, 592 to 570, they had exposure to the truth of God's word for hundreds of years. What good did it do them? None, because they were so hard-headed and hard-hearted. Have we had exposure to the word of God here? 90% of all of the Christian reference material that's produced today, that's published, it's produced in one language, English. The overall majority of it is produced in the English language. We have had the witness of the word of God declaring to us the God of the word for hundreds of years, since our inception. What good has it done us? And why? You know, in Italian way, but Mike's not here. Mike Variel's not here. He can tell you. In Italian way, we have a word for this. It's called cavados, cavados, hardhead. As my father used to tell me, oh, you're cavados, you know. <laughs> I probably was. I still am, I guess. <laughs> but hard-hearted and hard-headed, it's not good is it? to be stubborn. Can you imagine all those years? Jesus said, which of the prophets have your fathers not killed? Because they wouldn't receive the message. Ezekiel, they're not going to hear you because they won't hear me. They won't listen to me. And isn't that what's happening today? Mm. Can you think of some of the witnesses we've had? Look at some of the great Bible teachers and preachers that this nation has produced. Hmm? Billy Graham. Billy Graham, well, leading evangelist in the world, without a doubt. Billy Graham, his own statistics from the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association, out of 100 people that come forward in a crusade, how many are real? Three. Isn't that something? Yet they still do it. They still spend thousands, millions of dollars every year on the evangelistic crusades. Why? Because it's all worth it for the three, right? Even the one. It'd be worth it for the one. But can you imagine that knowing that, that out of 100 that come forward in the crusade, when they do all of that follow-up, when they look for a transformed life, when they look for the change that the Holy Spirit can bring in drawing an individual to the Word of God in order to bring them to a personal relationship with the God of the Word, three. Three. Absolutely. Jeremiah was successful. Ezekiel was successful. Timothy was successful. Are you successful? Simply in your obedience to the call, right? Mm. Billy Graham, who else? J. Vernon McGee, I love that guy. You like it? I, I, he's been dead how long? I don't know, it's been a while now. But he's got such a simple country wit to him. He's so intelligent. And he's such a wonderful way of expressing it, isn't he? Ah, beloved. We got all this exalted teaching and such low living. How do you understand it? Help me make sense of it now. All this exalted teaching, such low living. Mm. No, I don't think so. It was, um, who was the, 
It, it was an evangelist. Uh, do you remember, Ben? Yeah, but there was an evangelist specifically. Uh, Mordecai Ham. That's who it was. Yeah. But, but this nation has produced some wonderful, wonderful godly men and teachers, hasn't it? Tremendous witness for God and the word of God. But yeah, what's happened? The church is more anemic, lacking in strength, spiritual strength and iron concept than ever before. Yes, they will not listen because they will not listen to me for the house of Israel are impotent and hard-hearted. Behold, I have made your face strong against their faces and your forehead strong against their foreheads. Now, it's good to be hard-headed when God has made you hard-headed, right? And, and what he's saying to Ezekiel is don't, don't worry about the fact that, that their hard-headedness may be like a diamond. That's how hard it is. That stone is like a diamond. It's hard. But I'm going to make your heart, head even harder, Ezekiel. We cannot ever grow weary in doing good. Can we? No. In due season, we will reap our reward. You, you can't not give up. We can't. We can't. No matter what happens. Though the world be against us, Christ be for us, who wins? We do. We do. Can you imagine Noah and his boys building an ark to survive a flood? Something they've never, ever, ever experienced before in their entire lives. And for 120 years being mocked and ridiculed and scorned. Until the day that the flood came, the rains began, the promise fulfilled. Wow. But they didn't grow weary. They didn't give up. I'm sure there were plenty of days where they were discouraged. You ever get discouraged? Hmm? Yeah. It used to be Monday morning was my regular exercise in penning my resignation letter. <laughs> who, who, could do, who could do a sufficient job of representing Who? Especially a donkey like me, you know, you just, no. But when God calls you, you, ha you have to stay true to the call. You have to keep your shoulder to the plow and don't look back, but look straight ahead. You know, you can't give up. Don't grow weary. And your last days should be your best days in your service to the Lord. Right? We're just getting started. Oh, I love that 20% that really believes this is literally the word of God and should be interpreted literally. And who are those 20% for the most part? You, you, you guys. I was talking about my son and this young man that died from uh, overdose. His mother goes to my son's church, but he, didn't, he hadn't been there a long time. His father died of illness. And so when my son uh, was asked to do the memorial service, he did. It was attended by a lot of young people, and he told them there's a better way to live. And he, he challenged them at that service, and he said, now, if any of you are interested in knowing more about this better way and, and beginning a conversation about a better way, show me by a show of hands. And he said, there were probably 30 hands that went up. And he said, okay, I'm, I'm, you know, I, here's where I pastor. This is the church I pastor. And I want you to meet me on Sunday afternoon at 5 o'clock. And we're going to begin that conversation. How many of you want to commit to doing that? And he said, there's several hands, you know. Well, he, last Sunday is when they met for the first time. He had about 18 or so of these young people there. They're on church. They don't go to church. But they wanted to enter in the conversation. He said it was so wonderful, so stimulating, so exciting just to see God moving among this group, and, and we need to be praying for this generation of young people. They're so, so lost and so ignorant of their lostness. Hmm? But I was excited to hear about that. He told me about it when he did the service, and then he told me that they were meeting on Sunday at 5, and then I, I said, well, as soon as you're done, on your way home, call me. I want to hear what the Lord is doing. So it was really exciting. We were both very excited about it and praying about it. So even though God may be giving up on the nation, he hasn't given up on saving people, has he? No. He has a last day's witness, doesn't he? E even after the rapture of the church, does he have a witness? Yeah, there's two bold witnesses. Who are they? Mo I think it's Moses and Elijah. And then there's 144,000 sealed by the Holy Spirit of God. And who are they? 
12,000 from every tribe of Israel, Apostle Paul's. Wow, 144,000 Apostle Paul's. Amazing. So he has his witness, and he always will. Yes, I've made your head stronger than theirs. Verse uh, 9, like a damned stone, harder than flint, I have made your forehead. Do not be afraid. You remember chapter 2, verse 6? Three times God had to tell him not to be afraid. Look at chapter 2, verse 6. And you, son of man, do not be afraid of them, nor be afraid of their words. Though briars and thorns are with you and dwell among scorpions, do not be afraid of their words or dismayed by their looks, though they are a rebellious house. <laughs> it's difficult to preach to people who don't want to hear what you have to say. I've got to do a memorial service on Friday afternoon, and the majority of people that will be attending have no relationship with the Lord at all. So pray for that service and pray that... I can be used of the Lord to effectively communicate the glorious gospel of our God. And hopefully, he'll do what he wills to do. You know. But it's difficult sometimes when, uh, over the years, I've been doing this for a little while, I've had people sitting in the congregation who hated being here and seemed to have a real disdain for me, yet they're here. They'd sit there, and, and they would have such sour looks on their face. And I, I'd think to myself, why, why are you here? Are you here just to try to weird me out? <laughs> it ain't working. <laughs> you know, you know the average, yeah, listen to me, listen to me. The average pastor leaves the ministry for what reason? Six disgruntled people. Really, the majority of pastors who leave the ministry leave the ministry because of six disgruntled people. Oh, gosh. Yeah. Yeah. And I tell them, if anybody's leaving, it ain't me. I just want you to know that, you know? <laughs> That's what God had to remind Ezekiel. Don't be afraid of their faces. Don't be afraid of their rejection. Don't, listen, and it's not you, Samuel, they rejected, right? Remember what God told Samuel that? It's not you, Samuel, they're rejecting. It is me. 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 Ezekiel, it's not your word. It's my word they're rejecting. And that's what you need to understand. It doesn't, it doesn't matter how receptive or unreceptive the audience is. Our responsibility is to proclaim the message. But so many today are more concerned about the result than they are about being faithful to the message. That they water it down, and it's been so watered down, hasn't it? Hmm? Uh, I did a teaching a few years ago on the distinctives that every church should have, several distinctives, but there are denominations that represent those distinctives by and large more than any others. You remember any of that? You remember some of those? What were some of those distinctives? I'm sorry? Yeah, the, the evangelical church, that the heralding church, we call that. that, that that church's emphasis was on the proclamation of the gospel, that every, every Sunday gathering would be an evangelistic service, not necessarily a discipleship time where they teach the word of God, but getting the saved saved all over again, right? But... but if that's the emphasis that God has placed upon their heart and that's what God has called them to do, then they need to be faithful to that calling. And what denomination would most characterize that? Baptists. Baptist. And the Baptists have done a wonderful job of getting people saved, right? Of evangelizing what they've done a very poor job and the expense has been to the detriment of discipleship. Um, Gail and I were up at the Cove not too long listening to Jim Henry. Anybody know who Jim Henry is? He used to be the president of Baptist uh, Southern Baptist, Southern Baptist Sem uh, Conference. And he, he said that's the biggest problem in his, his, his experience in 60 years of Baptist life is that they're so weak on discipleship. And that's true. But, but they are very strong in evangelism. What were some of the others? Orthodox. Orthodox. The Orthodox Church. The Orthodox Church is very, very, very concerned about doctrine. They slice their doctrine very, very thin, very precise on what they believe and making sure you understand what they believe. Who would that be? Presbyterian, covenant churches. Presbyterian in particular. They have the highest academic requirements for their clergy. 
but yet there seems to be such coldness there, you know, doctrinally correct, but but a coldness, right? Who are some of the others? The serving church. What what uh, denomination represented that church that really wants to meet the the physical and, uh, needs of the of people today? The Methodists. Methodists, very very much. What other aspect of it? All of these different distinctives should be in every church, right? The charismatic church, more uh, concerned about the gifts of the Spirit. And what church would that be? Pentecostal, Calvary Chapel. You know, Calvary Chapel is in that slice of the pie. If you slice the ecclesiastical pie into all of these different distinctives, where Calvary Chapel fits is in the charismatic church. Because we do embrace the gifts of the Spirit. We do have a tremendous dependency upon the Holy Spirit, but not to the expense of sound doctrine. You know. What else? What were the other? Orthodox, heralding, praying church. That church, that, that aspect of the church today that really considers prayer the most important work of the church. And what church would represent that more than any other? Persecuted church and the church of Asia. You know, the largest church in the world is where? South Korea. South Korea is the largest church in the world, and they have prayer going on 24 hours a day, seven days a week at that church. There are people lined up outside to get in church to pray at 2 o'clock in the morning. Isn't that amazing? But they place such an emphasis upon prayer and the need for prayer. Am I forgetting any? Covenant church. The covenant. Those who embrace covenant theology recognizing that they place more emphasis upon the various covenants than they do that God is working in different ways in different dispensations or periods of time, what church would represent that? The covenant church more than any other? Catholicism. And, and covenant theology. When I was up at the Cove, we were having some conversation at the dinner table. If you ever go up there, you know, you sit with, you, you and your wife will sit with, three other couples, because they're tables of eight. And, and they're people from quite a number of different backgrounds uh, within the church. And one of the people I was sitting with, he was a pastor, and he didn't understand how covenant theology could possibly be responsible for anti-Semitism. But, that, you know, I mean, some people just don't understand that. Being an ex-Catholic, I understand that completely. And the overemphasis upon covenant theology and particularly some of the heresy that it'll bring about, brings about replacement theology, where there's a disdain for Israel, anti-Semitism. So covenant theology is responsible for progressive and for, for passive and aggressive anti-Semitism in the world. I forget anything else? I think that covers it. Hmm? But every church should have those distinctives, Right? We should understand that, that God is a covenant-keeping God, but he does work in various dispensations of time. You know, covenant theology and dispensational theology should not be in contention, just like men and women shouldn't be, right? You're meant to complement one another, right? You work together. Well, you'll see a beautiful parallel and harmony between dispensational theology and covenant theology if you really look for it. You know. John Calvin, and who's the other guy? Jacob... Armenians? They had far more in common than they had differences. But, but today, because of the hyper-Calvinism you know, and, and uh, hyper-Armenianism, you know, it's, the world's apart. But that's not how those two men thought. They were far closer together than most realize. And so should we be, right? How did I get there? Let's see. Their works, their looks. Don't be afraid. Don't be concerned about the way they look. Don't be... Overly concerned about the fact that they're not receiving the message. And sometimes, you know, most of you know who Chico Lopez is, right? Francisco? Francisco, how long have we known Francisco now? Oh, my goodness. Almost 30 years. His wife started coming to the church. We were doing a Spanish church, and a Spanish service and an English service. I had a, a Spanish fellow who was interpreting for me at that time because we had quite a few Hispanic people that were coming. And, uh, but I didn't speak Spanish. And so I had an interpreter. But most of the people there, Hispanics, wanted to participate in the English service and wanted me to speak in English because they wanted to learn English. And um, Chico's wife, Marlene, she was coming to the service, and she got saved, and God was doing some incredible work in her. And uh, 
if you know Chico, you know, he's a, he's a big, uh, burly guy, strong man. He would come in the service, and he'd sit there in the chair, and he'd fold his arms, and he'd look like he wanted to kill me every service. I mean, he'd just stare me down. And, and I'm thinking, man, this guy, you know, this guy wants to do me bodily harm, you know? And it was week after week after week until one Sunday morning, he's just sitting there crying. You know, how the Lord penetrated his heart. But I would, I would have never known that that was taking place by his outward appearance during those services. I'm thinking, this guy's not receiving a thing I'm saying. Yeah. And, and now he's a closer to me. He's a more of a brother to me than my physical brothers will ever be. I love that man, you know. But don't worry about their faces. Don't worry about the, the response you're getting right now because that doesn't tell you anything. I can remember this young man, Will Peters, witnessing to me when I was working at G as a foreman on a night shift, and he was on a training program, and he would try to witness to me. He said, you need the Lord, and I'd say, get out of here. You know, and I didn't use that kind of, and the language I used was not acceptable. But it was a cover-up, because so much of what he was saying was penetrating my heart. I just didn't want to show it. And it wasn't very long after that. I started listening to this radio program. He kept giving me the call letters to and insisting, and I listened to it. It was the word for today with Chuck Smith. <laughs> and so I started listening to the program, and then I came in, and I said, come into my office. You know, what have you been telling this guy about me? <laughs> because, because every time I would hear the program, I think, the guy's talking right to me. You know, now, I don't know who he is, but Will turned me on to him, and Will must be talking to that guy. You know? He wasn't. It was the Lord talking to me. He knows everything about me. He knows everything about you. So, Ezekiel, don't worry about their faces. Nor be dismayed at their looks, though they are a rebellious house. And over and over and over, God is going to talk about their rebelliousness, their hard-heartedness. Moreover, verse 10, he said to me, Son of man, receive into your heart all my words that I speak to you. Hear with your ears. Hear with your ears, but believe not in your head, but believe in your heart, right? So important, you need to understand that. A lot of people have a lot of head knowledge, but as I've said to you before, an ounce of heart knowledge is worth a ton of head knowledge, isn't it? Go to Romans 10. Romans chapter 10. Hi, Gail. She's not feeling well. She's uh, hurt her back. So she's been on her, on her back for the last few days. But feeling much better, aren't you? Yeah. Uh, chapter 10 of Romans, verse 8. But what does it say? The word is near. You and even in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that he raised God from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes to righteousness. With the mouth confession is made into salvation. It is so important that we are penetrating to the heart. That's why I so much enjoy using the way of the master as a witnessing tool, because it, it bypasses the intellect, goes right to the heart of the issue. And what's the heart of the issue? You're a sinner. And so many people just don't believe that they're that bad. Well, they may not be as bad as somebody else that they know, but compared to God, we're wretched, aren't we? Yeah. Now, here's the question. How much of God's word have you really taken into your heart? When you take it into your heart, it does change your life. It's, it's the code by which we live by. It's, it's when we begin to do the right thing, we hear the word of God speaking to us, affirming, right, through the conscience. But when we desire or are tempted to do the wrong thing, then we hear the word of God again, accusing, no, 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 right? It's the word of God that informs the conscience, but it goes through the heart to inform the conscience. Because the heart is really the, the motivation of it all, isn't it? Hmm? 
The head may be an instruction, but the heart is the motivator, the desire. Yes, son of man, receive into your heart all my words that I speak to you and hear with your ears. How do you know a person's received it in their heart? What happens when you're in love? When you give your heart to somebody? You're totally devoted to them. You'll do anything for them. Anything. Right? Because it's your heart. And it, it's so easy. It's so natural for you. It's just a natural response of, of this love that swelled up within your life, within your heart. And, and I'm not talking about the, the organ on your chest, right? Because, you know, the Hebrews, where did they think the heart was when we're talking about this issue, the heart, that motivator? In your, in your bowels, your stomach, the core of who you are. And so when you're in love, you, you're infatuated. You can't, you can't stop thinking or speaking to or speaking about that person or that thing that you're in love with, right? You know, you don't need to spend much time with anybody if you can get them to start talking to you, and you'll find out very quickly what they're in love with or who. Hmm? Well, that should be true for us. I, I, I thoroughly enjoy having conversations about my God and about his word. Nothing gives me more pleasure. Why is it so difficult to get you to talk about the message on Sunday mornings after the service? Now, I'm not asking you to answer the question. But what I want to talk about after a Sunday message is the Sunday message. <laughs> I really appreciate Roger because he's always coming up to me after the message, has something to say about the message, you know. <laughs> and and, and I, I appreciate that because that's what I want to talk about. You know, when someone talks to me uh, about counseling them, I said, I'll counsel you and I will offer you a one hour counseling session, but you have to come to three services a week. If you're a man, you come to... Sunday morning, Wednesday night, Saturday morning. Why? Because all of my counseling that I'm going to do to you is going to come out of what I've been studying from the Word of God. The Word of God is what we need, right? What's the solution to every single problem we have? Jesus. Jesus. I don't care what it is. I don't care what you're dealing with. If you draw closer to Jesus than you ever have been before, you're going to be okay, whatever the situation is. Is that true? It doesn't matter if you're going through a divorce, if you're going through bankruptcy, if, if you've got physical health issues, whatever it might be, your children, whatever the case may be, you draw close to Jesus and you're going to be all right. I can't help what other people do, but you, you'll be okay, right? And so when I counsel with somebody, I'm going to, I'm going to draw out of what I've been studying for the last several weeks and speak to them through the Word of God. I'm going to counsel with the Word of God. Now, if they don't come to three services, and I tell them it's going to be $75 an hour. <laughs> it's reasonable. It's a professional fee, right? How many think, <laughs> how many of you think want to pay me the $75? <laughs> now, now, if you're not sitting under the Word and you're not receiving it in your heart, when you do counsel with me, you're going to think I'm a terrible counselor. <laughs> you gotta, this, this man doesn't know how to counsel. <laughs> Somebody told me that recently. You know, you're a good pastor, but you're a terrible counselor. You know. I, I'm not going to tell you what you want to hear. I'm going to tell you what God has to say. And so when my first wife had cancer, we had a wonderful uh, cancer doctor, oncologist. And, uh, but he, he said to us, very early on, he said, now, Mr. Bariel, my son was there too, and we were bombarding him with questions. He wanted to know if we were engineers. I said, no, we're not engineers. He, he said, but listen to me, um, and listen to me carefully. I'm going to answer every one of your questions. I'll answer it honestly. You be very careful about what you ask me. You know, because when we started down that road, I mean, I knew at best we had five years. Right from the get-go, you know. But he was being honest with me, and he was saying, just be very mindful of the questions you ask me. You not, may not be ready to receive the answer. And that's what happens sometimes, you know. You know, if you're 
trying to minister to someone, be very mindful of their situation because they not be, may not be at a place where they're prepared to hear what you have to say. And so you, you just may have to not say it right now. You know. And I have told people before, you know, you want to pray before you speak to me because you may not want to reveal all that to me and you may not like what I have to say in response. You know. The men's study. It gets difficult for the men, doesn't it? You know. If a man has been married any length of time at all, and he's not happy with his marriage, who's, who's, who's to blame for that? Yeah. She is. <laughs> it's a woman you gave me. <laughs> That's what most guys would say, wasn't it? It's a woman. It's a woman. It's her fault. No. You've been married any length of time at all, and, you don't like, and you're not happy with your marriage? I'm to blame. If I've been a pastor any length of time at all, I'm not happy with my congregation? I'm to blame. If I've been a father any length of time at all, I'm not? I'm to blame. I have to shoulder that responsibility. It's my stewardship. And somewhere I failed, right? Now, it's important for us to recognize that because who's perfect? Who's the perfect husband? Who's the perfect father? Who's the perfect wife? Who's the perfect whatever? Only a perfect God, right? I don't know how we got there. But I let, I let David do all the counseling now. Go and get the captives. Go Get to the captives, to the children of your people, and speak to them and tell them, thus says the Lord God, whether they hear or whether they refuse. Now, we know that, that Ezekiel was prophesying and ministering among the captives. Jeremiah was where? He was back in Jerusalem in Judea, that everything is coming apart, and he was ministering there. Where was Daniel? In the king's court. He was ministering in the, the royalty as a, an official, a diplomat. Right? So God always has his witness, and where does he have us right now? We're here among the destruction of the city. <laughs> but God wants to use us. God wants to give you a voice. Then the Spirit lifted me up, and I heard behind me a great thunderous voice. Blessed is the glory of the Lord from this place. Yes, Ezekiel, you've been called to be a prophet now, and glorious is this calling. Wherever we are, we bring the Lord with us, right? Because he's always with us. He'll never leave us nor forsake us. And so when you enter into that calling that he has for you to minister, it's a glorious place. I also heard the noise of the wings of the living creatures that touched one another and the noise of the wheels besides them and a great thunderous noise. So now the throne of God is going to be lifted up. And so the spirit lifted me up and took me away. And I went in bitterness in the heat of my spirit. What does that mean, the heat of the spirit? Anybody have an interpretation? Anger, rage. What is he angry about? The hard heartedness, the hard headedness of the people. Isn't it so frustrating? Doesn't it anger you how the enemy has beguiled so many people? It is so frustrating today to see the ignorance that is so massive. I came here in 19. 19- 89 from New York. In New York, in the area I come from, Albany, New York, the claim to fame, I told you before, the most biblically illiterate city in the country. Biblically illiterate. We had a Bible or a strip, I mean, a bar or a strip joint on every corner. I came here, I'm thinking, oh my God, this is going to be glorious. I'm in the buckle of the Bible belt. Heaven, it's going to be heaven, right? Boy, was I surprised. Wow. What amazed me. And at that point, I had only been saved nine years. What amazed me was how massive the ignorance was here in the buckle of the Bible. But with regard to the Bible, they said they believe. We stand on the Bible. And I said, well, get off it, open it up, and read it. <laughs> well, is it not true? And even today, it's worse. It's worse today than it was when I came here in 1989. The ignorance with regard to the word of God, and there's no desire or hunger for the word. Why? Because it's not in their heart. It's in your heart. You can't stay out of the word. Yes, I went in bitterness in the heat of my spirit, but the hand of the Lord was strong upon me. And then I came to the captives at Tel Aviv. What does it mean? Green Mound. Green Mound. Tel Aviv, where the refugees were, who dwelt at the river Chebar, and I sat 
where they sat, and I remained there astonished among them for seven days. Now it came to pass at the end of seven days that the word of the Lord came to me, saying, hmm. he was overwhelmed. You ever been overwhelmed by the presence of God as God speaks to you through the word of God? And, and it's, just, it's just overwhelming to the point to where you're, you're so there's a divine paralysis. You, you just have to stop and just take it in, what the Lord is doing, you know, and what the Lord has shared. And this is what happened to Ezekiel. Happened to Paul, didn't it? Paul got slain on the road to Damascus, right? The Holy Spirit came upon him. And then shortly after his conversion, what happened to Paul? I'm sorry? He went to the wilderness. He had a divine isolation for uh, as many as seven years. We don't know for certain. Somewhere between five and seven years, Paul was gone. And who, who went and fetched Paul to begin to minister to the church? Son of encouragement. Barnabas. Barnabas. Barnabas went and got Paul and brought him back to Antioch so he could minister to the new believers. But, but, but Paul had to be in this period of isolation, just taking in, wow, everything that happened. He was physically able to see. He knew the word of God here, right? Because he, he devoured the Old Testament. Gamaliel, the principal Rabban, the teacher in Israel, couldn't keep enough manuscript in his hand. He, he devoured everything he threw at him here, but hadn't gone here yet. Physically, he could see, but spiritually, he was blinded. But then what happened? On the road to Damascus, he is physically blinded, but spiritually never saw clearer. I was witnessing to this woman the other day, and I said, listen, in the world and in scientific observation and discovery, seeing is... Believing. Seeing is believing. But, but in spiritual matters and in matters of faith, believing is seeing. Once you believe in your heart, once you accept what God has said, then God continues to give you more and more revelation and understanding. Enlightenment. It's true. It's true. It's happened to me and it continues to happen. I'm so thankful for it, right? Believing is seeing. It's not seeing believing. But Paul had to have this divine isolation period before God could put him into the ministry and use him. It's good to, to sit and allow everything to be processed. You know, that's why Paul says, do not lay hands on a new believer, on a young believer. They're not mature enough yet and haven't processed everything that God is taking them through. I'm so thankful right after my salvation. I mean, I just, God was pouring it into me. And my principal disciple was my wife and my son. And I was pouring it into them. And that happened for five years. For five years I did that. Just receiving of the Lord and giving it back to my family. That was most important for me. So thankful. The divine period of isolation. Seven days astonished. Son of man, I have made you a watchman for the house of Israel. Therefore hear the word of my mouth and give them warning for me. Loud and clear. What were they going to say? Danger. Danger. Are you giving a word of warning? You know, I've had people come in, they, they criticize the ministry here because, you know, it's so negative. Sorry. Every, every good ministry needs to, needs to share the good, the bad, the ugly. Every ministry has a positive side and a negative side. It's true. You either turn or... It's true. I didn't say that. Jesus did. Right? But we don't want to tell anybody anything that's going to offend them. Right from the start of his ministry, God is declaring to Ezekiel, you have to give them this word of warning. What do we call that in the New Testament? Edification... Edification, exhortation. Exhortation is a word of warning. Edification is building up. Exhortation is a warning. You better take heed. Right? We ended Timothy last Saturday. Take heed to yourself, pastor. That, that's what Paul wrote to Timothy. Take heed to yourself, pastor. How many, how many prominent ministers have gone down? because they haven't taken heed to who you really are, right? Pride cometh before 
the fall. And this, this celebrity Christianity of today, it's causing many, many people to fall. Yes, give them a warning for me, verse 18. When I say to the wicked, you shall surely die, and you give him no warning, nor speak a war to warn the wicked of his wicked way to save his life, that same wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood I will require at your hand. Wow. Hey, it's, it's, listen, it is a very serious matter to respond to the calling of God to minister to people, because now the responsibility that you have and the accountability you have is far greater. Somebody says, how many people do you minister to? I said, far more than I want to be accountable to on the Day of Judgment. Far more than I want to be accountable to. And I'm accountable for every word that I speak to you. And not just the precept, not just the words, not just the teaching and the doctrine. I'm accountable for the way I live my life, for the example I set before you. And I will give it a stewardship to that. This is what he's talking about here. But I have a responsibility to warn the wicked of their wicked way. And that's why there has to be that negative aspect of the ministry as well. Where you warn people, you can't, you can't play fast and loose with the Lord without thinking there's going to be a consequence. I, I, why do I keep telling you it's 2%? It's 2% that do what? It's 2% that do what? And it's 2% that do what else? It's only 2% of the church that tithe, and it's only 2% of the church that share their faith on a regular basis. That's a warning. Jesus will say to the many, depart from me, I never knew you. We never had an intimate relationship. Listen, it was never in your heart. If it's in your heart, you'll open up your life. If it's in your heart, you'll open up your wallet. If it's in your heart, you'll give everything to the Lord. There's nothing that is in His. People spend more on their pets than they do on the kingdom of God. People spend more on eating out than they do on the kingdom of God. So it, it, that's an exhortation. And if, and, if, and if the Lord is touching your heart, I'm not trying to convict you, I'm trying to touch your heart. If the Lord is touching your heart, then repent and change. It's, it's wonderful to see if you can outgive the Lord, because you can't. <laughs> the more you give to the Lord, the more he gives in return. The more you give to the Lord, the more you give back. The more you give, wait a minute, no. <laughs> gotcha. No, you don't. Gotcha. <laughs> Yeah, you can't outgive the Lord. And he's always asking for more so that he can give more. It's not that he wants to take anything from you. It's, it's the amount of his life he wants to add to you. Hmm? We have a responsibility to warn the wicked men of their wicked way. I had a conversation with a friend recently, you don't know. Um, I said, so where are you going to church? Eh. So where are you tithing? And so what do you think about that? So I asked him, what do you think about that? Most importantly, what do you think God thinks about that? Why don't you think about that and call me in a few days? No, I wouldn't say that to him unless I was saying it in love. I love the guy. But I, I know the situation. And it's not, it's not the way it should be. We, we have too many belong, believers, but they're not belongers, right? What do I mean by that? And J, that's a J. Vernon McGeeism. Beloved, we got all these believers, but no belongers. What does that mean? They don't go to church. They're not committed to the body of Christ. The only way you can experience that koinonia, the fellowship, that union with Christ, is through his body. Now, hey, we're going to hurt each other. Get over it. Right? It's going to happen. Okay? But get over it. I'll say I'm sorry, and your responsibility is to forgive me, okay? <laughs> yeah, but it's amazing today. We have all these people who profess to believe, but you know, never go to church. Profess to believe, but give nothing to the Lord. Profess to believe, but so timid. 
in giving a word of witness. But yet they claim to be believers. Hmm. You got to warn the wicked man of his wicked way. Now, especially if someone is in sin, right? It can be so deceptive, too. All that's necessary for something to be defined as sin is what? Hmm? Be disobedient to the Word of God. Would be, be just simply disobedient to any of the commands that God gives in His Word. Um, we talked about the SBC. The SBC is so compromised. It's unbelievable. They're spending a year now. The last uh, gathering, they decided they're going to spend a year studying this subject, and, and next year at their convention, they'll give the report on what? You know what it is? I'm sorry? Yeah, yeah, they're, they're, they, they had no chutzpah. They didn't have the strength to warn Rick Warren that what he did was a violation of Scripture because Rick Warren gave all the statistics of how great he and his church are. That they have trained and sent out more pastors than three denominations that he can mention. What did Rick Warren do recently? He ordained three women to be pastors in his church. That's a violation of scripture. Yet the SBC would not call it a violation. Why? He's a big name in the SBC. He's a big church. It's a big movement, Rick Warren. Do you know that there are 100,000 pastors throughout the world that regurgitate his message every Sunday to their congregation? Did you know that? 100,000 pastors, at least, at a minimum, that download his Sunday service his Sunday message to give to their congregations the next Sunday. Huh? What happened to teaching the Bible and praying and receiving from the Lord that which you share with your flock? That's what Paul said. That which I have received from the Lord I now impart unto you. And that's what I pray. Lord, you give me what you have for this flock through your word as I come to you. So, so they, they've got together a group of people that for one year they're going to study what should be the proper understanding of the qualifications for ministers within the Southern Baptist Convention. Huh? We've known what that is for 2,000 years almost. I mean, it's right here, isn't it? Cowardice. Terrible. Warning the wicked of their wicked way. Who, who brought about all those conversions? Who brought up those men and called them to be pastors? Who? Was it Rick Warren and his church, Saddleback? Or was it the Lord? Now, if it was Rick Warren, then they're his ministers. You know, if it was Rick Warren, then, then they, they con he converted them to whatever it is that he believes, right? But if it was true faith that they were converted to, if it was true calling into ministry, then it was the Lord. It wasn't Rick Warren. But you should have heard his prideful, arrogant boast in all of that as he's berating these men within the Southern Baptist Convention who are challenging his ordination of women. Who are you to challenge me? You look at the numbers I have? Well, then we should all become Mormons. Or, or, or at the very least, Muslims. They're having a better conversion rate in the world than Christianity today. Sad. So that's the first scenario. You've got to warn the wicked man his wicked way, and if you don't, his blood will be upon your head. The second scenario, verse 19, yet if you warn the wicked and he does not turn from his wickedness nor from his wicked way, he shall die in his iniquity, but you have delivered your soul. Praise God. That's our responsibility. Again, when a righteous man turns from his righteousness and commits iniquity, and I lay a stumbling block before him, he shall die, because he did not give him, because you did not give him warning, he shall die in his sin, and his righteousness, which he has done, shall not be remembered, but his blood I will require at your hand. This is the third scenario. Last scenario he gives to Ezekiel is nevertheless, if you warn the righteous man that the righteous or that the righteous should not sin, and he does not sin, he shall surely live because he took 
warning. Also, you have delivered your soul. That's an important thing we need to do is call people to righteousness. Warn them of unrighteousness. And call sin, sin. And not because we want to judge anybody. When's the last time you've been in a church where they exercise church discipline? Here. Now, when do you exercise church discipline? When, when you speak to someone who's in sin and they won't turn from that sin, and that sin starts to affect other people in the body, you can't allow that to go on. That's a cancer within the body. You've got to cut it out. Not for the sake of condemning them or destroying them, but, but hopefully that they'll be restored. Paul did that, remember? He's talking to the Corinthian church, and he said, this is not good, your permissiveness. You've got a man sleeping with his father's wife, and you say nothing about it. Now, hopefully it was his stepmom and not his biological mother, right? But what did Paul say? What was Paul's words to the church then? Deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, so that in the day of the Lord the spirit could be saved. Now, Paul considered this man to be saved based upon some experience he must have had with him, some demonstration of fruit. But he's saying, listen, he's acting like such a heathen, such an unbeliever. You need to cast him out because he's going to corrupt the whole body. A little leaven. Leaven's all lump, right? And what happened in 2 Corinthians? The guy was restored back to fellowship. The, the discipline had its desired effect. He repented. That's the purpose for discipline. I mentioned Chico, right? Chico Lopez? You know, he's a stonemason. Very generous man, very kind man, very giving man. We had someone come into the body and, and, and took advantage of him. He had several crews working for him. He's a stonemason, and, and they, they uh, would not pay him several thousands of dollars of work that he did for this. You don't know these people. This happened years ago. And so all Chico asked for was the money that he had to pay his laborers. Don't, don't even give me what, what I'm due. Just give me the money I have to pay my laborers because you're reaching in my pocket. That's the expression he uses. You're reaching my pocket. You're stealing from me. Well, uh, then I found out about it. And Chico was not the one who told me, but I found out about it. And I sat the guy down. I said, you pay him right now, right now, or you leave this church. You're no longer welcome here. So you know what that man did? Got on his checkbook, wrote him a check. No, he left. The money was more important than righteousness. Isn't that amazing? Hmm? Hmm. So we have these scenarios, but it's important. It's important that the church not only preach righteousness, but display righteousness and then hold one another accountable for the standard that you've been giving. Isn't that what you do with children? Well, we used to. Days gone by. <laughs> we don't do that anymore. You know, my son was raised to a certain standard and he was expected, it was responsible, it was expected of him that he would reach that standard of behavior that I expected of him. And it wasn't optional. And, and let me tell you what I need to do to help you get there. You want to be a coach, right? But sometimes you need to be a law enforcement officer. <laughs> you know, you both. When does a church ever hold anybody accountable to anything anymore? No. Mm. 13%? 13% of teaching pastors in the country, what? Do you know the statistic? It just recently came out. 13% of teaching pastors in the United States of America hold a biblical worldview. Only 13%. Teaching pastors. 87% are secular? No wonder why we have the situation we have today. No wonder why apostasy is rampant. And they're beguiling these people who are sealed. You know, I grew up in Catholicism. When I truly got saved, I couldn't believe how I was liked. I was so mad at the Catholic Church. I, I went through my first communion. I went, you know. 
and then realizing how much I've been lied to, misrepresented. You can't work your way to heaven. Catholics should try. But we got the best deal of all. You go to confession on Friday or Saturday, and then you go to church on Sunday, clean, covered, safe. Then you go back to your dirty all over again. Just make sure you make it to confession Friday or Saturday before you die. Hmm? But what was most upsetting was the number of people in my family who believe all of that. Even to this day, look at the people who fall prey to these cults, these false religious systems. The doctrine of Bethel, elevation, you know, Joel, Osteen, it's heretical. It, it's, not, it's not the true gospel. But how many people believe that, even know that, even aware? Hmm. This is a serious matter that God is raising with Ezekiel. This is a serious matter for everyone who wants to represent him in ministry of any type. The hand of the Lord, verse 22, was upon me there. And he said to me, arise and go out into the plain. And there I shall talk with you. This is the uh, Mesopotamian basin is where he was. So I rose and went out into the plain. And behold, the glory of the Lord stood there, like the glory which I saw by the river Chebar. And I fell upon my face. And the Spirit entered me and set me on my feet and spoke with me and said to me, go shut yourself inside your house. Yeah, the hand of the Lord and the word of the Lord, right? The word of the Lord is the instruction, the hand of the Lord, the empowerment to do what God's instructed us to do. And you, O son of man, surely they will put ropes on you and bind you with them so that you cannot go out any among them. But I will make your tongue cling to the roof of your mouth so that you shall be mute and not be a reprover to them, for they are a rebellious house. What is God, duplicit? Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. How do we make sense of this? Well, basically, what God is saying is, look, you don't go anywhere and you don't open your mouth until I tell you to go there and I put the words in your mouth. An ambassador simply represents the nation that they are an ambassador from and to the country that they are serving at that time. We're ambassadors of Christ and we have no right to alter the message in any way but just to herald the message as it is given. And so God was just telling Ezekiel, you're going to go where I send you, and you're going to say what I tell you to say, and nothing less and nothing more. But for a time, there'll be this divine silence. The silence was to be bringing the people who would listen to Ezekiel later to conviction. You know, sometimes your, your silence is far more powerful than anything you say. You ever been in one of those settings or meetings or situations where just that, that silence becomes so convicting at times? Will you say not a word? But when I speak with you, I will open your mouth, and you shall say to them, Thus says the Lord God, He who hears, let him hear. And he who refuses, let him refuse. For they are a rebellious house. Whew. It's only a remnant, beloved. Jesus would say over and over and over again during his ministry, he who has a ear to hear, let him hear. Who gives you that ear? God. God gives you that pierced ear to become his doulos, his servant, to hear. Well, we better stop at say 34. It's a good stopping point. We'll finish the chapter. David, you got a closing song? Shall we stand? <laughs>